Welcome to another exciting Ask GMBN Tech, where you get to ask me, well, and others, the whole hive mind of GMBN about your technical questions. So use the hashtag uh, AskGMBN Tech on any of the off-road videos and yeah, we'll, we'll find it and we'll hopefully answer it. So keep the questions coming in and we'll sort you out with wonderful answers that hopefully help. Question here from Nathan Cole. Um, today, he learned about RockShox torque caps versus regular cap ends. He's building a bike from a parts bin bike with fairly new RockShox recons and a new set of wheels with regular cap ends. Um, and yeah, he's just kind of wondering about what the tech is and what the performance benefits are. Effectively, SRAM RockShox introduced this back in 2016. It's a different standard on your fork and hub interface. I know you're scratching your head, you're going, another interface. No, no, it's kind of normal. It's not a different axle. It's not a different axle width. It's just that inside face that's bigger. So it goes up from a 21 of a normal hub to this torque cap, which goes up to a 31. And the bigger diameter means that there's a bigger contact between the hub and the axle and all of that assembly and the fork, which means in theory, it should steer much stiffer and it should be a stiffer, better fork. Um, Unlike UDH, the rear derailleur thing, it hasn't really taken off as well. Um, but you don't have to run torque caps to use a torque cap fork. So yeah, it's out there. You can get upgrades if you want to get a slightly stiffer fork. Lovely question here from our friend Tim. Thank you very much for sending it in. And he's asking about way, way back. There was a time when braided hoses were an upgrade to a bike. What are you talking about? You may wonder. Okay, braided hoses were an upgrade that were available on well, quite a lot of different brands of hydraulic disc brake. So brief synopsis about how hydraulics work. We all probably know, but just a check. Effectively, you can't squidge fluids. Um, so as long as you've got no air in the system and the fluid is kind of controlled in a tight way. So when you pull your lever, the fluid moves down the hose or the force of which, and then pushes those calipers in. If you've got really squidgy hoses, uh, well, the fluid would just move those hoses and squidge. Uh, and if you've got really strong fingers and you've got a lightweight XC brake, sometimes you can actually feel it even now. Um, so looping back to the question, the braided hoses where it was kind of a, a knitted mesh of metal was the idea that, you know, wrapped around the hose is that these provided a much stiffer and stronger brake feel. Um, and uh, yeah, the facts were it did make a bit of a performance upgrade. You could feel it a little bit at the lever. Um, yeah, there were downsides to it and that was it was heavier, it was harder to work with, they were much more expensive. It was a real fancy upgrade. Um, they often sort of re like reduced the inner diameter because the kind of the hose is a regular diameter, but then we've got this metal sheathing on the outside and then a sort of regular hose assembly. So. Potentially, there was actually maybe a bit less flow in there. Um, as time's gone on, brakes have gotten better and better and better. Materials have improved and manufacturers have kind of realized what brake hose works and what doesn't. So um, I guess we've had progress in that material and also we've had so much advancement in the levers and the pistons and the whole setup of a caliper. So uh, yeah, it's, I feel like you could still get the upgrade kits out there. Um, but yeah, they're quite, just quite a lot of faff. So I don't think it was marketing bull at all. I think it was more that the technology at the time is sort of limited. I guess we could see in motorsport that uh, braided hoses were a thing. Obviously in, in motorsport, the temperatures are much, much higher. So you might need to use that braided hose to protect the fluid from heat or protect it from actual abrasion of of hitting a moving tire, for example, uh, and not a small, you know, 2.3 tire, I mean like a, a car race tire. Whereas, yeah, we don't really need that. Um, also, yeah, the stock cables have got so much better. So sort of rambling answer to that is that we've had a lot of progress and maybe we don't need the performance gains that we thought we did. Great question here, all about bushings or bearings for jockey wheels. Is it worth the upgrade? Um, Right, okay, so brief sort of bushing versus bearing. Uh, I mean, both are bearings. Bushings are more a solid bearing material. So often used in jockey wheels, effectively you'll have a solid kind of like uh, composite sort of rolling structure that the jockey wheel spins on versus an actual cartridge bearing with little balls in and a structure in a cage and little seals either side. There's some brands that do very, very fancy ones. 
and I say fancy ones, fancy bearings, where they've got, you know, ceramic materials, which are very round and spin. And these parts do spin incredibly well. So why would you want your jockey wheels to spin more? Well, it can save you some watts. You can get slightly larger jockey wheels because that means that the chain is not doing quite as much of a, an S-bend, so it's got slightly less friction. Um, and whilst I've got bikes that do have drop bars, I'm not really a roadie, but the roadies go wild for the marginal gains. And I would say this kind of tips into one of those things. So if you've ticked off all the regular maintenance and your bike is in incredible top race condition, there's a point where these marginal gains can really make a difference. And I'm not knocking them at all, and it sounds like I, I am, but I'm not. However, there's some really big stuff that gets in the way of marginal gains working on mountain bikes, and often that's mud. Um, so bearings aren't often as good as working in really muddy, cruddy conditions. So yeah, that marginal gain is kind of chomped away. I think, I guess the next reason is also that for some rear mechs, having that top jockey wheel float a little bit is advantageous, so it can help with shifting. But yeah, I think the biggie is just this bushings versus bearings in off-road, horrible, muddy, gritty, even really dusty conditions. The part that the bushing setup has got less moving parts and is more robust, even though it might roll slightly slower, than the bearing one, which has more moving parts, but might not be as robust. Nice question here from T Mill 2001. How do pinion bikes, rear suspension, handle chain growth? Okay, we're talking, we're covering lots of things here. Pinion bikes run gearboxes, uh, so you've got an internal gearbox, and lots of them are running belt drives. So that not all of them are running belt drives, but quite a lot of them are. That's gearbox bikes in general, not just pinion. Um, so we've got lots of points to cover. And if you think about a bike with a rear mech, the rear mech has got the lower cage, which, which moves. And if you've got rear suspension where the points between the kind of the chain uh, bottom bracket position and the rear axle are gonna change, that means that at some point, it's either gonna get longer, hopefully, because that, that's better for suspension, or it's gonna get shorter. And that's what we call by chain growth. The chain isn't really growing, but effectively the chain state is growing. And that happens when you've got these moving points. Um, so yeah, great question of how, if you haven't got a rear mech and you've got a belt, and the belt needs to be at a very specific tension so that it grips in the, in the kind of like teeth setup that it's got, how does it stay there? Well effectively a spring tensioner, which is what we've got on a rear mech as well. So effectively it's gonna have a sprung tensioner much like, okay, this has got a clutch and may not work for me, um, but that's under load, it, it's sprung loaded and it's a clutch. This is just a normal cable rear mech, but effectively you'll need a similar setup for a belt drive with suspension. Um, there are different belt drives, some of them work really well. They've got kind of like channeled sections. Uh, I'm thinking some of the gates belts. Um, but yeah, they'll just have to have effectively like a, not like a, not dislike an idler um, on some of the high pivot bikes where you have the idler, which helps with the tension. Um, so yeah, sprung tension is the, is the key answer to that one. Stress ball Steve. Great name, great question. What difference would it make switching or swapping between a spider slash chain ring uh, and changing the chain line from 53 to 52? It's a good question. When we had triples, chain line was pretty much, well, the middle chain ring, and you had to play around with the bottom bracket spindle length when there were square tapers. When we moved to external, you could play around with other stuff in terms of like the shimming of those external cups. And now with boost, we've got lots of different options of chain line and chain ring size as well in terms of where that chain ring sits. So without being kind of annoying, 53 to 52, you've only got one mil of difference. So that might be fine, but it sort of depends. When we say that chain line, we're looking from the back of the bike to the front, uh, and we're looking at how far spaced it is on the, the axle of the crank. And depending on the bottom bracket width, and depending on the width of your bike, whether you're running boost or super boost, and also the chain line that it's been built around, it will depend on what you need. Um, there's kind of a range, I think Shimano, for example, have got three different length cranks. I think it goes from a 49 to a 51, I think they do, and then they go up to a, a 55. Ideally, you kind of would move uh, to the correct ones. Some of it is just gonna be down to the way your bike has been designed, because it will have been designed and optimized around one chain line. With the difference between a 52 and a 53 chain line, 
do have a look at your bike depending on how the chainstay uh, and sort of like bottom bracket area is shaped and that sort of yoke shaped of how much tire clearance you've got one mil could mean that you have a really bad interface between chainring spinny thing and non-spinny thing of the frame so have a look at that for most frames i'd say one mil would be all right um but have a look at at your bike and see how close that chain rig is. Realistically, as you could, might imagine, like the rear of the bike is really wide and specifically the cassette is really wide. So one mil at the front, okay, it will make a bit of a difference, but not as much as if you're getting it completely wrong in the chain line, completely wrong by like five mil or by six mil by running the wrong one. Um, but essentially, if you check your manufacturer, they should give you much better guidance as to whether to go for the 53 or the 52. Um, and yeah, check that there isn't any interface issues. But yeah, great question. Fun question here from Reggie. Great question, thank you. Um, he's got snow melting. That's not his question. He's about to start riding and he wants to know, like, should he check the sealant in his tires and his tubeless? And yeah, is it still liquid and what should you do and how can you refresh it? Great question. Um, and yeah, a first thing is it will depend on what sealant you've used. If you've used PTs or the myriad of other stuff that's out there, it will depend on what brand you've used. Yeah, definitely check it out. Some sealants are prone to drying up completely. Others sort of reduce sort of their liquid volume a little bit. Um, but it's a really good idea to sort of open up the tire bead and have a look at what you've got in there. Um, if you've got some wet sealant in there, then definitely top up to the recommended amount. Um, and if it's your first ride out, I'd probably go heavier because you might need a little bit more. Might be spiky things out there that you'd not seen before. Disposing of the tire sealant, it gets a little bit trickier. There aren't super strict guidelines from brands, but individual brands have got good advice. I think the the main thing is don't pour it down the drain. Um, remove as much of the sort of excess sealant or old sealant as you can. Probably mop it up, um, but it'll probably have to go in your regular household waste bin. But talk to your individual brand um, because then you'll have the specific guidance for the different sealant types. Um, but yeah, top it up, inspect your tire. We've actually got a video coming out fairly soon on all the other checks that you need to do on your bike before you hit the trails, if it's been hanging up and you've been enjoying your skiing. So great question, Reggie, and uh, hope to hear back from you soon. Well, that was a huge heap of fantastic questions, and please keep them coming. We've got a whole hive mind of fantastic people, from Blake, who can flip any bike, from Anna and me that are tech nerds, uh, to World Cup racers both at Downhill and Enduro. Uh, so yeah, fire in your questions, use the hashtag AskGMBNTech, and we'll try and answer them. But the more questions, the better. We want you to have an awesome experience, and if our tech brains can help you enjoy your bike more, all the better.